Coming up on DTNS, Robinhood, Reddit, and retail investors. Oh, my. Apple earnings are in for that all-important holiday quarter, and Facebook's independent oversight board weighs in for the first time. This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, January 28th. From Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. In lovely Cleveland, Ohio, I'm Rich Straffolino. From Oakland, California, I'm Justin Robert Young. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Before the show started, we were talking about our fond memories of that sitcom Night Court roommates from hell and all sorts of other stuff. If you want to get a wider conversation in our expanded show, Good Day Internet, become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. WhatsApp now supports adding a fingerprint, face, or iris scan to use as a second layer of authentication on the desktop or web. Android and iOS devices are used for the biometrics, which must be paired with the desktop client through a QR code. The latest version of the messaging app Telegram on iOS now allows users to import their chat history from WhatsApp, also Line and KakaoTalk, allowing participants to continue conversations in Line. Group and individual chats are exported individually. U.S. and Bulgarian authorities this week seized the dark website used by the NetWalker ransomware cybercrime group to publish stolen data from its victims. In connection with the seizure, a Canadian national suspected of extorting more than $27 million through the spreading of NetWalker was charged in a Florida court. YouTube is now testing a new clipping feature with a small group of creators, letting them make short clips of live streams or videos between 5 and 60 seconds that will have their own unique URL. The feature is currently limited to desktop and Android devices, but eventually both creators and viewers will be able to create clips by clicking on the clip icon. And Samsung reported overall revenue grew 2.8% on the year in its Q4 to 62.55 trillion Korean won, about 56.4 billion U.S. dollars, even as revenue from its mobile division fell 11% on the year. Quarterly profit was up 26.4% in the year, driven by the highest ever quarterly earnings from its display division and strong demand from its memory business, although Q4 profits did fall 26.7% compared to Q3. All right, let's talk a little bit more about the GameStop saga, <laughs> which <laughs> has really evolved quite a bit since we talked about it yesterday. We had Marketplace Tech's Molly Wood on to tell us a little bit more about short-selling stocks and what was really going on with the GameStop situation, uh, how a subreddit had driven a lot of retail investors to try to kind of take on the old hedge fund community and it's messy. It's messy. So here's where we are, at least of recording at this point today. The stock trading app Robinhood confirmed that it placed trading restrictions on several stocks. That included GameStop, also AMC, that's for AMC Theaters, BlackBerry, Koss, and Nokia, letting users close or sell positions, but not buy new shares. So it effectively kind of, I don't know, made the whole thing plateau, which it might not have organically otherwise. A pop-up on Robinhood's homepage said 56% of its users own at least some GameStop stock, which gives you a sense of how many folks were actually participating in this. Uh, in other Robinhood news, a class action lawsuit, this is probably the first of many, has been filed against Robinhood in the Southern District of New York, and it reads... Robinhood purposely, willfully, and knowingly removing the stock GME from its trading platform in the midst of an unprecedented stock, thereby deprived retail investors of the ability to invest in the open market and manipulating the open market. Justin, I know you've been following the story. Uh, it's a wild one. What do you make yeah. of this? Well, <laughs> there is no doubt that this is an absolute seismic change in terms of how uh, retail investors are going to uh, treat themselves. But the the big change here is that we've seen punitive action come in, not only from Robinhood, but also from Webull, which was another uh, a trading platform that people left Robinhood to go to when they made this uh, decision. And, and the larger question is exactly why they made this decision. A lot of questions on exactly uh, of whether or not Robinhood's parent company has some financial stake in this game and whether or not they were protecting their own interests here. This is a meme that liquidated so much money from uh, hedge funds that now we're seeing what happens when those folks 
who, by the way, are not only billionaires that run things like that, but those are that's billionaire money that that goes into the hedge funds that are making that are that the people are trading for. We're going to see exactly how loud they can rattle these chains. And and what we've seen over the past couple of days is pretty loud. Yeah, the, what's interesting to me is seeing this go from being a a Reddit story to kind of uh, because of the amount of money that's set, you know that that's at stake. Um, seeing this kind of reverberate, obviously there were numerous affected hedge funds, you know, um, uh, and Molly Wood talked about that yesterday on the show and, and kind of that the, the financial impact side of this. But seeing the the tech platforms react to this. Uh, I, I think has been really interesting and, and how Robinhood goes forward from this. We already saw, I, I, I even hesitate to call it uh, losing a ton of goodwill, but they filed a settlement earlier this year effectively deceiving, uh, 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 they filed a settlement with the SEC about deceiving customers about you know what they were charging for transactions and stuff like that. Obviously, this is a several orders of magnitude bigger uh, a problem for their imaging for an app called Robinhood uh, to seemingly uh, be be halting trading on on something like on these you know uh, you know meme stocks or whatever you want to call them. Uh, I also I don't understand. I get all the other ones, but costs is a weird one to me. Just on a personal side all, note, all of these are shorted stocks. So this is where all of this all of this began was on a list of the most shorted stocks on the market. Uh, GameStop was number one, and it was insane right. short. It was not, I'm sure there's a few people who would love GameStop to come back and like change their business model and be successful, but mostly it was, hey, this is a great way for us to make money. There was no, uh, and, yeah. and also th there was not enough stock for the hedge funds to buy back. And so if everybody bought the stock, it was going to rise, and and that was there was no way for it to stop. All those other companies that you've seen. BlackBerry, Nokia, Cost, Tootsie Roll, uh, uh, <laughs> they, are, they are all there because they were also on that list of the most shorted stocks. That's the only connection between all these things. Uh, I thought uh, it's just a coincidence. These are all nostalgic brands. They just oh, happen to be emphasis on okay. nostalgic, as yes. in yes, uh, okay. you know, I, I, you know, maybe the heyday has been over for some time. It's interesting watching the uh, spirited debate online about Robinhood, but really about you know any. Um, uh, trading institutions that have halted trading of all this stuff saying, hey, listen, things are too volatile. We don't know what's going on. This is a little too crazy. Uh, nobody can participate for, you know, at least in the way that they want to, to make a quick buck until we figure out what's going on. You know, a lot of people are saying, well, who's, who's, uh, you know, who's leaning into Robinhood? What's going on here? You know, does... Yeah. Do the hedge hedge fund people, and I'm using hedge fund just as you know the people who have a lot more money and have been doing this for a while, do they just win because that's the way that it's been thus far, and they're just more powerful? Uh, and then other people saying, I mean, you know, Robinhood's a startup, you know, you, you you're using it for free. I mean, what'd you expect? Like this is, you you didn't think it was just going to be this easy, did you? So I think that I mean the story is is just beginning because if the market can be manipulated so easily. And you know, Reddit is Reddit is a very powerful thing when it wants to be, but this could happen all sorts of other places. Well, uh, and, and and Reddit's argument is this was happening. This has been the process. The process is CNBC has a revolving door of hedge fund people that come on and tell retail investors buy this stock, don't buy this stock, and they are doing it nakedly in their own self-interest because they want to better their own positions and they can move the markets by talking about it on the TV. They've decided, Wall Street bets, Reddit has decided that they can, you know, ho, 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 I have a machine gun now. <laughs> they can play this game as well. That's, that's the question. And so when we get into who's manipulating the market, it really depends on who you're talking about. Yeah. Well, in uh, other things that happened since about 24 <laughs> hours uh, ago on, on January 27th, Discord confirmed it had banned the server used by the Wall Street Bets subreddit, saying that it continued to allow hateful and discriminatory content after repeated warnings. However, today, Thursday the 28th, the new server was set up with Discord staff actively working with the server's team to help with moderation, as well as scale infrastructure to keep up with its rapid growth. The Verge reported the new server had about 296,000 members by 2 p.m. Eastern time. It has more than that by now. 
Reddit also confirmed that the subreddit was taken private for about an hour on the evening of January 27th. That's the Wall Street Bet subreddit. Once public again, the moderator said that they were working on automated software to deal with the surge in traffic, but hadn't been granted special API access by Reddit, pointing to the Twitter account WSB Mod for Public Communication. All right, Justin, what's going on with Apple? Did they make any money? Oh, you know these guys. They're always raking it in. Apple reported it earned $1.68 uh, uh, per share in Q1 on record revenue of $111.44 billion, up 21% on the year and beating analyst expectations iPhone revenue was up 17% to 65.5 billion services up 24% to 15.76 billion and other revenue including Apple Watch earpods up 29.7% to 12.97 billion Mac revenue was up 21% with 8.68 billion while iPad revenue grew 41% to 8.44 billion dollars a lot of cash coming in for old Tim Cook and Co yeah, good uh, good quarter for Apple. Um, I, Rich, I I know you you were you had some thoughts on how some of these numbers break down, and did anything surprise you? Were there was there any uh, you know revenue area where you were like, huh, they either did better than I thought or not as good? Well, remember the heady days of last quarter when it was the first time they exceeded a hundred billion dollars in revenue, and that was a big deal. And it turns out, nah. 111, let's just make the little house and we're good. The one that, the categories that stood to me actually um, were uh, Macs and iPads. I mean, seeing that iPad revenue jump, uh, 41%. Uh, if you look at Q, you know Q1 last year, uh, this is uh, you know kind of a big reversal for iPad fortunes. That's kind of how iPads go. They're a little bit of a uh, you know people keep them I think for a little bit longer than something like an iPhone or at least that's been the trajectory historically. But last year Q1 2020 uh, iPad sales or revenue excuse me was actually down 11 percent. Um, same thing with Mac revenue uh, down three and a half percent at that point as well. There's a number of reasons for this. Obviously, people, uh, you know, iPads an economical way. If you need something for uh, to do some uh, Zoom calls or something like that, have really, you know, nice uh, cameras on the front. Uh, certainly uh, usable for a lot of education purposes as well. So not surprising to see that. Still, 41% for kind of an established category like that is surprising to see. Uh, Max, kind of the big question with that was where are we going to be with the M1 uh, based Max? Obviously, you know, the reviews that came out were pretty enthusiastic, uh, I would say, for that. Still, it was interesting to see how consumers would react. Uh, it seems like in the first quarter that they've been up for sale. Uh, you know, uh, definitely, uh, it's a big quarter for Max. That's the second, just for some context, that's the second most revenue that Max have generated for Apple ever. Uh, and the last one was uh, uh, Q4 last year. Um, so Apple kind of on a, on a high tide for Max for a number of reasons. They refreshed the professional line or, uh, uh, last year. They're updating all of their Macs now uh, with this new processor, kind of opening up the door for some performance gains and stuff like that. So uh, those, though, to me, were really all the other ones. We know iPhone revenue is going to go up, whether sales are actually going up. That's another question. We know services are a huge uh, you know, realm of emphasis. We know AirPods are extremely popular. Apple Watch owns the category, essentially, in a lot of ways. Those were the two that stood out to me. Yeah, the Mac revenue, not surprising. You know, you got the M1 chips. They've been pretty universally well received. Uh, we've got new M2, perhaps, you know, the next gen M M chips uh, coming to a lot more uh, in the Mac line this year. I wouldn't be surprised if Mac revenue had a pretty good year in general, depending on when we start seeing some of those new models. I also wonder, you know, in the other, other, other revenue category, you have Apple Watch, you've got um, the uh, the the AirPods. You've got stuff like I don't know Home, home pods. Yeah, right. You have you know USB C charging cables that aren't getting included <laughs> anymore that you have to buy now. But I wonder, and you know, and and I don't actually have an Apple Watch, so I can't sign up for Apple Fitness Plus. But I wonder how many Apple watches because it's a, you know it's a popular item anyway. How much Apple is going to benefit from something like that, where they say this is a really great service. 
However, you need this relatively expensive piece of hardware in order to use the service. There's no way around that. Um, it might give them a nice bump into the next couple of quarters. I think services is the big thing to watch. And so far, you know, you had, you had, you had a big gain, uh, of, you know, with, with 24% here, it's at 15.72. That's already bigger than the Apple watch and, and, uh, uh, the ear pods all together. That's a huge for the future of, of Apple, probably more than any one product, to be honest with you. I was a little surprised about that iPad, those iPad numbers, Rich. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I know it's, you know, pandemic year kind of makes sense. You know, you're stuck at home. Maybe you're, um, you've got a kid in school. They it's wanted an, an iPad for a while. Priority, right. Know? Yeah, That's a exactly. Thing. All right. If you want to uh, give us some ideas of what you'd like to hear on the show. You've got a lot of options, but one of those is our subreddit. <laughs> yes, we have one too. You can submit stories and you can vote on them. Sometimes they even include financial news, but often they don't. Da DailyTechNewsShow.reddit.com. All right, so some other uh, Apple-related uh, uh, items here. Uh, Apple CEO Tim Cook uh, maybe throwing a little bit of shade at the keynote address for the EU's Computer Privacy and Data Protection Conference. He didn't mention Facebook by name, but he called on the need for international agreements around the principles of data minimization, user knowledge, user access, and data security, and reiterated the need for a comprehensive privacy law in the U.S. This is the Computers Privacy and Data Protection Conference, after all. He also defended the addition of opt-in ad tracking transparency to iOS, framing it as about returning control to users while being critical of businesses built around misleading users and data exploitation who could that be? In completely related news, the information sources say Facebook is preparing an antitrust lawsuit against Apple, and we'll get into that uh, in a little bit here. Uh, but I, I, I wanted to kind of set up uh, uh, Tim Cook uh, talking at this conference, really kind of drawing the battle lines uh, in a lot of ways for what we can expect for this ongoing. You know, we've seen Facebook taking out these front page ads on various newspapers trying to frame this as, hey, we're protecting developers and we want uh, we want things to remain competitive and we don't want to take away these ads from mom and pop shops that are depending on these to get their business out there, especially in during a global pandemic. Uh, Tim Cook kind of coming back hard with some very definitive language uh, and, and really not mincing words, even though, you know, maybe not mentioning Apple by name or Facebook by name, excuse me. Yeah, well, this yeah, Apple and Facebook are, you know, they've been going at it for a while. Go ahead, Justin. Yeah, no, and 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 really, this was even before Facebook. Before Facebook, it was Google. It, it is it is the idea that Apple wants to, in part, both for branding, and I do think because it matters to it. it they don't rely on selling advertising. Facebook and Google do, and selling advertising means harvesting data, and so they are going to differentiate themselves from the marketplace, and they have for years on those lines. This becomes more interesting. Now that we're seeing antitrust questions being brought up with all of these companies. And so they're all trying to put pressure on each other with the understanding being that the government is going to come and the American government is going to come and do something, what they do, how severe it is. That's a larger question, but this is front of mind because of those pressures. And and kind of like I mentioned, uh, like the information sources were saying, uh, Facebook might be leading the charge on that, preparing that antitrust lawsuit against Apple. Uh, and they're claiming they're abusing their market position, forcing third-party developers to follow App Store rules, even though they don't apply to their own. Apple, for instance, can use their own first-party uh, 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 tracking for a lot of stuff as opposed to third-party stuff that they're making opt-in. On Facebook's earning call, CEO Mark Zuckerberg said Apple regularly interferes with how other apps work on its platforms. Oh yeah, this is uh, it, it is a tough it is a tough one, right? Because it's like, well, it's true. Apple is holding itself to different standards, but is that antitrust? Um, Facebook says it is, uh, but uh, you know, there's a there's some other news in Facebook, isn't there, Justin? Indeed, Sarah. Facebook's <laughs> Independent Content Oversight Board issued its first five rulings Thursday and overturned four instances where it found Facebook unfairly infringed upon users' speech and misapplied vague rules on content. One example found Facebook's algorithms were wrong to remove a post about breast cancer identification that featured a woman's nipple. Another found Facebook too strict in removing a French user's post praising hydroxychloroquine. 
The board felt Facebook shouldn't have taken down a post from a user in Myanmar with photos of a drowned Syrian Kurd child along with negative text toward Muslims because the post didn't reach the level of hate speech that justified removal. Now, if I'm not mistaken, all the independent board can do, the oversight board can do at this point is say, hey, that thing shouldn't have been taken down. It should be reversed, not this thing that is up should be taken down. Isn't that right? Yes, the, 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 there has to be an action, and then they will review the action, right. and then they will, they will make a ruling. I believe in instances where Facebook itself refers a decision to keep up content, the board does have oversight, but people, like users, cannot submit keep up decisions uh, yeah. uh, to the Facebook oversight board. Only, only Facebook can do that at this point. This is really interesting, though, because and sure, these are early days, but the whole question up until now was, all right, well, there's this content oversight board. I mean, how effective is it really going to be? What kinds of things are they going to disagree with Facebook about? And is that going to be a problem in the future? Whether or not it's a problem in the future remains to be seen, right? We've got a few examples, though, of the board saying, yeah, Facebook did this and it thought it was doing the right thing. But here's why we have decided it shouldn't have happened. And people are looking at it as precedent. That's the big question. This wound up breaking through in political circles today because they this this board has a big decision that is going to be rendered within uh, less than 90 days, and that is whether or not former President Donald John Trump will get his Facebook account back and whether or not he was removed. And there was one case in this particular batch where somebody uh, had a, a quote uh, that was probably misappropriated uh, to Joseph Goebbels from uh, the, the Nazi party in Germany uh, that was critical of Donald Trump, but they said that that should not have been taken down because of unclear uh, guidelines on dangerous individuals. Some folks have looked at that and said, well, you know, if, if, if they're going to be going after Facebook, not necessarily for, for any... Uh, a thing other than them just being too vague in why they are pulling these kinds of, or wh why some of these posts are going away, whether or not that is the argument for them to restore access to that account. So th this is something where people are tracking precedent. Th this went from zero to Supreme Court, like really fast. <laughs> yeah. Well, and we've made that comparison before on the show is it's like Facebook's Supreme Court. Yeah. Because Facebook can't then say, well, actually, can it? Can Facebook appeal and say, no, we want that woman's post about breast cancer to come back down. It's inappropriate. They well, can, but they'll eat they'll they'll eat the criticism for it. Mm -hmm. Well, and it it's also interesting to me, given uh, the hydroxychloroquine one, I thought was it was an interesting example and kind of that Supreme Court kind of kind of look at uh, how to interpret, uh, you know, uh, how we should uh, uh, you know take down speech or stuff like that in that. They were like, yes, this was misinformation, and yes, it was related to something we actually have rules about misinformation about. But because, like, there, uh, there, there wasn't, a, a, and there isn't an ability for people to go out and actually get this. Like, it, it's not like you're saying like chug bleach or something like that. Uh, that because there's like a limited harm to it, that it, that they were like, no, you can put it back up. So I, I think that kind of that kind of focus on like let's leave speech unless it meets these you know these very specific criteria will be inter an interesting precedent going forward well i think in the case of the french user praising hydroxychloroquine it, it the the board said well the it was being praised by people it is it is much less praised than it was at one point. But at one point, no one was saying this is misinformation. It was this could be something that's helpful to people, but we're not totally sure yet. It has since changed, but the user wasn't necessarily trying to spread the misinformation at the time it was posted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, meanwhile, on the earnings call, Mark Zuckerberg said that the Facebook platform will no longer recommend civic and political groups to its users. He further said that Facebook is considering steps to reduce the amount of political content seen in the news feed full stop. Interesting. Uh, you got to you got to wonder whether some of that is, uh, you know, let's let, let's cut down on some of these oversight board cases that are showing up. <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't. That, that, I don't. That, that, I don't that, hang out on my newsfeed all yeah. that much. Uh, my Facebook newsfeed is 
I don't know. I don't really know what's going on on my news feed. I check it like once or twice a week uh, because I like to keep up with folks. But I do feel like the political content, and I felt like I was seeing a lot of it, you know, mid-2020, for good reason, right? You know, we're coming up on a U.S. election, but I've seen quite a bit less. And maybe that's just, I don't know, the algorithm knowing what to filter out for me. But but, uh, reducing amount of political content seen in the news feed... Some people are going to be upset about it. Uh, I don't think recommending civic and political groups to his users was probably the best idea. Seems like a great way for Facebook to say, hey, we didn't do it. You know, if you joined something, it wasn't us. Yeah. Well, let's see how long they keep up. (laughs) Well, I've got some good news for anybody who uh, has something in common with me, and that is that I have to have 50 to 60 browsers open in my browser tabs, rather, open in my browser at any time. I also use different desktop views. So really, I probably have like 150 tabs open, uh, depending on what uh, what I'm looking at at my computer. I don't know why, I just can't close a tab. It means I'll lose it forever and I'll never get it back. So if you're a tab hoarder like me, you might want to rejoice. Vivaldi Browser version 3.6 has a new two-level tab stacking feature. That's right, you can go horizontal or you can go vertical. So you can max out the number of tabs you have open at once without them becoming those tiny little icons horizontally where you actually don't even know what tabs are open anymore. So users can now choose between compact, that's the normal, what we're all used to stacking, or two-level organization. Vivaldi also offers the ability to display tabs off to either side or even at the bottom of the browser window. So if two-level tab stacks is enabled and you have side orientation, you can see two tab columns rather than just one. Get it? Yeah, columns, you know? <laughs> get, get spreadsheety here. The Vivaldi browser supports uh, tab hotkeys, tab searching, pinned websites, recovered tabs, tab tiling. They're tab crazy. They you are. Know? Is it just me? Am I the only I, person I, no, who's... I, 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 I try to keep my tabs as low as possible. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to minimize the tabs in my life. So yeah. I have I have used Vivaldi specifically. They had a feature before this. It was just like single tab stacking where you could just kind of like group stuff together, but it didn't have this multi-tier kind of level to it. And I never liked it because it just meant I was I still had to click through like twice basically to kind of see what I to kind of get where I wanted to. You know, for someone that has to have a lot of tabs open, you know, maybe for putting together like a a, a daily tech headline show or something like that. <laughs> I I could actually see like it it looks ridiculous. It truly does. And you're starting to get to the the point where like your headspace in your browser starts infringing on the content uh, maybe a little bit in the in the in the kind of more expanded mode. But uh, Sarah, I'm kind of with you. I'm I want to try this out. Yeah, I, I listen. I just started using Firefox full time from Chrome a couple months ago. It was when I got my new uh, MacBook Air. So. I'm not totally ready to just switch browsers again. What I would like, though, is for this to catch on in other browsers. Because, you know, as we all know, once a browser does something that people love, then all the other browsers say, oh, well, if you want that, we'll do it too. Yeah. (laughs) All right, moving on to the mailbag. Brian wrote in with some feedback about my latest Live With It segment, which is up for patrons. Uh, We'll open it up to to other folks uh, in about a week or so on patreon.com slash DTNS. But uh, I had reviewed at and TV Now, which is now defunct. It's at and TV, <laughs> but that's a longer story. Uh, hopefully, you can listen to it and enjoy it. But Brian said, I was listening to the Live With It segment and wanted to point out something about the alphabetical channel sorting. That was something that I had pointed out I really liked. He says, YouTube TV does allow custom channel sorting. And after I was a subscriber of DirecTV Now, which preceded AT&T TV Now, I was so used to the alphabetical sorting that I had to change YouTube TV sorting to alphabetical as well. It's a manual process. You gotta drag and drop the channels into the order you want. Bit of a pain, but if they, and if they add channels, you have to update the sorting. But a benefit of the custom sorting is you can also hide channels that you know you'll never watch. That's a good tip, Brian. When I used YouTube TV in the past, I never thought to do that. And I guess it would be kind of cumbersome, but if you like the alphabetical, which I do, it's like, why hasn't it always been this way? It's a good little, <laughs> good little life hack tip. If you have an uh, email that you'd like to send us, whether it is a life hack tip or a question or a comment or anything in between, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. And we want to give a shout out to our patrons at the master and grandmaster levels, including Linnell Lane, Carmine Bailey, and Eric Holm. Also, thanks to Justin Robert Young for being with us today. 
Uh, po- politics never die. So what's been going on in your world? <laughs> Are we, we're going to be talking about some of the political fallout of this GameStop situation on Friday's episode. And we will also be joined by Jody Avergan, formerly of 538 uh, and 30 for 30 podcasts on ESPN and uh, his uh, own new show, uh, This Day in Esoteric Political History. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, if you want DTNS as a video podcast, because that is an option, you can get the video RSS feed at dailytechnewsshow.com slash subscribe. Also, thanks to all of our patrons that support us at dailytechnewsshow.com slash support. We're live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 21.30 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. And we'll be back tomorrow with Lamar Wilson and Len Peralta. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Frog Pants Network. Get more shows like this at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>